I will be talking about a very hot topic <laughs> yeah, uh, that may be responsible for the attendance <laughs> today, uh, fake news. So, uh, Jean. Okay. Well, welcome. I, um, we had no idea what to expect. <laughs> we said there could be 10 or there could be 50. So we're happy with 10 <laughs> and appreciate all of you coming this morning and giving up um, giving up, as, as Julian said, this beautiful day. And Kara, what can we do about feedback? OK, thank you. Um, so I guess I want to begin with talking a little bit about why this is an important topic. Um, you know, misinformation and disinformation can influence people and in their beliefs and in their decision makings. And with the speed of dissemination today in this, what I would just best describe as an unmoderated information universe, it's maybe never been more important than it is now to think about what kind of information we're getting, how we evaluate it, how we decide whether we believe it or not, and how we pursue um, the best information we can find. Um, Thomas Jefferson admonished us regarding the importance of an informed citizenry. Um, indeed, democracy relies on people having good information, um, and information that they can trust, information that's truthful. and um, uh, you know, we, we might wish that there were laws or technology or other solutions that would stop the flow of disinformation, but ultimately the problem belongs to um, us, the information consumers. Um, so with that, let's talk a little bit about where we're going for today. Um, I'm going to start with talking, giving a little bit of background about the issue of fake news, um, what factors drive fake news into our information universe, and then I, I think we're going to take a look at uh, media bias, where we get our information, and um, looking at how authoritative or balanced those sources of information are that we use. And then finally, you are going to help me talk about systemic solutions to the problem, what can happen at a, at a level beyond our personal level to, um, to improve the kind of information that's available to us, or are there solutions? I guess that's a, a bigger question. So that's our plan. Um, I, I always like to start with talking about why librarians are talking about this topic. So um, I think a lot of times the public doesn't really understand us. We, we have this paranoia that the world does not understand librarians. So we always like to help you understand us. Um, and I think people don't think about the fact that we're trained as information specialists. We, um, we study, um, we, we teach information literacy, which is a term that's been around since the 70s, talking about um, how, how consumers of information can um, access and evaluate information that they, um, that they seek. Um, and then we study information science, and information science really, um, I, I always have to look at my notes because it's a long list of things that it includes, um, but it's the effective collection, storage, retrieval, dissemination, <clears throat> and use of information, and the associated technologies that make all of that happen. And then we study library science. And in library science, one of the major issues or topics that we cover there is connecting that, all of that information and all of that technology to the person who needs it, the end user. So that's our background. And it seems a very good fit with the whole issue of getting information and getting good information. Um, and you know, we just like it. <laughs> what can I say? I think it's important to make some uh, distinctions uh, of terminology before we begin. So I, um, there are a few things that fall under that, ru uh, under that rubric of, of news and fake news, or of fake news. And the first one is misinformation. Misinformation is simply errors. And journalists are human, they make mistakes. You, oftentimes they will correct them. You may not see the correction, but you might see the mistake. Um, so for example, this, um, this screenshot from Fox News says, Trump cuts US aid to three Mexican countries. I'm fairly certain that nobody at Fox News thinks there are three Mexican countries. At least I'd like to believe that. <laughs> so this was a mistake. They meant to say Central America or something similar. Um, so mistakes are, are, are less, I don't know, I, I find I have less difficulty with mistakes. Disinformation, on the other hand, 
is the intentional purveying of lies. That one, I think, is the most dangerous kind of fake news that we have uh, floating around in our information universe. Um, so an example, um, our president in uh, 2017, uh, speaking to uh, uh, a coal industry population, pointed out to them that there had been 33,000 mining jobs created since he had been inaugurated. But if you look at the Bureau of Labor Statistics, that number would be 800. That's disinformation. That's giving out a number that is far from accurate and clearly intended to mislead people about what he has done. That's the scary kind. Then there's satire. And I have to say, I find it amazing that from time to time, I have people quote something from the Borowitz Report, which is a totally satirical um, publication, um, as if it were fact. Um, so I, I think the Borowitz Report is hilarious. And if you haven't read it before, you should take advantage of it. Satire, obviously, is defined up here. And you'll see an example from the Borowitz Report recently. Mexico tightens the border after Trump pardons white collar criminals. <laughs> and the story goes on to say, they're bringing in bribery, they're bringing in tax evasion, they're bringing in racketeering, says the Mexican president. <laughs> so, so that's clearly not true. Um, but it's, it's intended to make fun of things that are going on in the news. <coughs> And so that's one to be aware of. But again, I'll emphasize that it's the disinformation that I find particularly, um, particularly concerning. Um, I, I have to say that this isn't a new phenomenon. And it goes back far before Jonathan Swift. But I think this quotation from 1710 in the Examiner speaks volumes about what we're dealing with even today. Um, so Swift says, in his essay, The Art of Political Lying, falsehood flies, and the truth comes limping after it, so that men come to be undeceived, it is too late. The jest is over, and the tale hath had its effect. And it, to me, this describes so well what we see happening in the fake news universe that many of us um, observe day to day. So keep that quote in mind. Because the notion of falsehoods flying and truth limping after it are important, I think, uh, descriptors. We, um, uh, the, the, Rand, the Rand Corporation published a report called Truth Decay in 2017. And it was a very interesting analysis of, of looking at fake news and the context that it sits in and why it, why it persists, why it works, why it travels around the way it does. And the context that they described was situated in these three modern trends, that um, the disagreement on facts and the interpretation of facts and data, the increasing influence of opinion and personal experience over fact, and the declining trust in formally respected information sources. And we're just going to take a quick look at those three trends to um, uh, clarify them a little bit more. So when we talk about the disagreement about facts, we have scientific factual information about vaccinations. We have scientific factual information about the safety of GMOs. The politics of GMOs is a different question. But the safety of, of, of GMOs in our food supply is, it, we have facts about that. And um, we have facts about climate change and its causes. And yet, we have, uh, we have a variety of interpretations of those facts some of which make sense, and some of which really don't. Um, and one of the things that I think that reveals, uh, for these topics in particular, is we have somehow a societal skepticism about expertise. Um, we talk about this in my family all the time, about the fact that um, for some reason, there is a segment of our population that doesn't tend to respect intellect. <laughs> I'll just say that. And, um, and I think we see that you know, exhibited in a variety of ways. And these three topics might be among them. When you have science, scientists who can, uh, who can fairly clearly explain the impact of human behavior on the climate, and we have people who dismiss that as if, it's, as if there's no, no likelihood of that being the case, 
that seems to me to be an, a, a, a suggestion of some skepticism about expertise, or at least lack of respect for scientists and the scientific method. Um, it might also reveal that we have a, a segment of our population that has relatively little actual scientific knowledge or understanding of the scientific method. So, um, so this is one of, the, one of the parts of our context that sits there that allows us to be uh, misled by disinformation. Um, so uh, the second one was, oh, well, um, I, should, I should back up. Another piece of that, then, is this notion of having the trouble distinguishing between fact and opinion. And I thought that this Pew um, study in June 2018 was very interesting. They gave people five statements and asked them to classify them as either a fact or an opinion. And you'll see over there that 28% of that population got two or fewer correct. So not being able to read a statement and tell you whether it's a statement of fact or a statement of opinion seems like something I used to teach in junior high back in the day. <laughs> but we seem to have a, a significant segment of the population that can't do it. Only, what, 26% of people got all five of them correct. And I will note that this was a, a, a randomly selected population in all, from all 50 states. So it's not just you know, that we kind of picked our population and made that, made that look the way we wanted it to look. Not, ha not at all true. The second trend I mentioned was the increasing influence of opinion and personal experience over fact. Um, and I think what we see today is this 24-hour news cycle. It's more hours, but not necessarily more news. <clears throat> and if you think about watching, um, let's say, CNN, and if you watch it through this lens, what am I hearing? Am I hearing facts reported, or am I hearing opinion and interpretation of fact? And I think we need to, you know, we need to discipline ourselves to be asking that question over and over and over. Because I, you know, when you look at, you know, if you go back and look at videos of what the news looked like back in the day. <laughs> um, uh, Listened to uh, to news. Admittedly, were I should have gotten away. Okay, my uh, uh, they they might have been a little bit dull. They weren't as entertaining, but they were mostly factual. And now we have much more entertaining news, um, but uh, much more commentary. So we had you know so we have this 24-hour news cycle where there's more hours, but not necessarily more news. We have the rise of cable news commentary. So pick your poison, any one of them. Those are all names you probably know. And most of them spend most of their time giving you commentary, but not giving you fact. And then we have talk radio, another story. <laughs> um, a third trend that was mentioned uh, earlier is this notion of declining trust. So we have uh, declining trust in government, declining trust in journalism, and declining trust in science uh, is, is what the Pew Research Study um, from 2019 would say. So that chart there looks at the percentage of people who trust the government. Um, and it starts uh, in 1960 uh, at a pretty high level when Eisenhower was in office. And you can see kind of the downward trend. You see the big peak there at 9-11 um, when Bush was in office and we, you know, we all gathered the wagons together and uh, uh, began to trust, uh, to some extent, our government for a while. But it didn't last too long. And then we came back down again. So this declining trust also contributes to, uh, to, to, to this environment that fake news lives in. So those three, those three trends are things that the Pew Report suggested, or excuse me, the Rand Report suggested, created a context in which this notion of misinformation and disinformation could survive. So then the question is, what drives that fake news through our information um, resources? And again, I'll rely on the, uh, the RAND report to, you know, to sort of generalize on what those things are. And three of the trends, or three of the uh, drivers that they identified, uh, three of the most important drivers that they identified were our own biases, kind of the way we we have a tendency to behave. 
Um, Changes in the information systems, which I think is the major, I think that's the most important one, along with trends in education. So we'll take a quick look at those three um, drivers. So uh, when I speak of uh, human cognitive biases, well, the first one that, I, that I'll mention is uh, what, what is described as an anchoring bias. So if there's a controversial topic, um, our tendency is, you know, we tend to form an opinion early on, and that becomes our anchor and it becomes difficult to dislodge that idea. So if when we first started the conversation about GMOs and GMOs in our food supply, um, if we heard or developed the opinion that those foods were not safe for us to eat, that there was something inherently unsafe or un, you know, unsavory about, about those foods, as we get more information and find out that there isn't a safety issue there, our tendency is to hold on to that first opinion we had for a long time. It's just our tendency. And so by thinking about that and uh, being conscious of that, we can defend ourselves against that sort of bias. Um, if we're unaware of it, then it can take hold for us and become a way of thinking and a way of, of, of evaluating new information that we receive. Another of those is what's described as the availability heuristic. So um, sometimes we have a tendency to base our judgments on people or events that are nearby, um, that are familiar to us. So if I see in the literature or somewhere on the web that I am a small stature person, and a woman, old, <laughs> um, a person like that should, you know, should probably you know, watch how much they drink every day. And um, you know, a, a, a half pour of red wine might be an appropriate amount for every day. And I think to myself, you know, Aunt Dorothy, she tipped a few every day, lived to be 100, no worries. I think this is baloney. I'm going to go with what I saw in Aunt Dorothy, and I'm going to have that second glass of wine or whatever. So it's, it's using the information that is close to you and filtering out new information to say, yeah, but it's kind of the yeah, but thing, <laughs> where we say, yeah, but Aunt Dorothy. So um, the availability heuristic means we take advantage of that which is very close to us and use that as a filter for judging information. Um, confirmation bias is sort of an overarching uh, phenomenon, but our tendency is to um, listen to information, read information, uh, uh, appreciate information with which we agree. And our tendency is to kind of disregard or ignore or just not look at anything that might question our, uh, our own uh, already formed opinions. So, um, you know, I mean, the simple little example is it's, uh, you know, if somebody thinks that they, they know somebody who's left-handed and who's very artistic, and then they, um, you know, and, and they kind of come to that conclusion that left-handed people are more artistic than right-handed people. Um, you know, they'll hold on to that uh, bias uh, because and and disregard anything that questions it. Um, this illusory pattern perception is another interesting one. It's what I affectionately call the one rat study. So we. Um, we as human beings, I think, have a tendency to try to see patterns in the things that we look at. And in order to form a pattern that is reliable, we need a number of data points. But we have a tendency sometimes to establish in our mind an idea based on too few data points. So for example, if we um, have read in the news about a, an African-American boy who had a hoodie when he went into a quick quick trip and you know stole something or pulled his gun on the proprietor or whatever um, it doesn't take very many of those for us to start thinking there's a black kid in a, in a hoodie I'm watching out for that kid or for schools <laughs> to make decisions that kids can't wear hoodies to school based on too few data points and then a judgment that takes us to a place that may or may not be valid and may, may or may not be accurate. So it's, it's, uh, it's, it's creating, seeing a pattern before the pattern is really there. I guess I would uh, summarize it in that way. 
Um, framing is another um, a tendency that we have. Language is powerful. Language is very powerful. And how uh, people or events or places are framed makes a difference in how we filter our information about them. So if we see a picture of someone like that and, that, and the, the caption is terrorist, we develop a certain mindset about that person or the pe people with whom that person is associated. If, on the other hand, um, they're described as a freedom fighter, that has a different connotation. And we start to interpret that person and their motives differently than if we called them a terrorist. So it's the power of language to bias us in, some, in one direction or another. And then our social relationships are um, yet another, um, another way in which our own uh, uh, behaviors tend to um, create filters for us about information. Um, when I was, a couple years ago, I took a course from Ben Kiefer. And in that class, it was right before an election. And he um, asked us all, as an assignment one week, to go uh, home and think about someone we knew who would be voting differently than we would, and talk to that person and ask them, you know, don't, don't create, don't, don't, don't attack. Just say, I'm just curious why you're leaning the way you're leaning for this coming election, and just try to find out what they're thinking and what's what's driving their decision making. So we came back the next week, 100 people or so in the class, and Ben asks for examples. And everyone sits just like you're sitting. And so he says, oh, somebody must be able to share an example with us. And finally, a woman raised her hand. And she, she described a little conversation she had with her brother-in-law. And then he says, well, there. Now we've opened the door. Is there anyone else? And we all sit for a while. And then finally, someone raises his hand. And, and he says, here was my problem. I couldn't think of anybody I know or that I'm friends with who would be voting differently than I am. <laughs> And all the heads started nodding in the room. Because in fact, we hang out with folks like us. <laughs> and we don't very often hang out with people with whom we you know, disagree. Um, uh, and so our social relationships kind of create this bubble um, that keeps us continually being you know, reaffirmed for the things that we believe, because other people nod their heads when we say things. And that feels good to us. Um, and those, those social relationships are, could really be called echo chambers, because we're just hearing the echoes of what we already think ourselves. And um, so that can, that can, again, create an environment in which um, fake news can certainly, um, can for, certainly uh, uh, be a part of our, of our information uh, behaviors. So those are those uh, cognitive biases that we carry around. And I, and I raise them for this reason. Because I think sometimes our best defense is consciousness about our own behaviors. And if we can be conscious that these are possible behaviors that we can fall prey to, then we can say, oh, you know, I'm just listening to the stuff I always agree with. I'm going to switch channels or something like that, that will force us out of that bubble and get us into a different kind of conversation and help us broaden our perspective a little bit. So I mentioned before that I think that the big, uh, so we had those, those biases were around back when Jonathan Swift was writing about uh, the political lying. So those were a part of his universe as well. They were, you know, we we're talking about human beings. The systems of information, however, have changed dramatically since 1710. And they have, uh, this I think is kind of the big push towards how, uh, how our, um, our news universe is different from, um, from when, um, when he was around. One of, the, uh, one of the big things that happened, I think, was the end of the Fairness Doctrine in 1987. The Fairness Doctrine was a rule, a set of rules under the FCC that um, were introduced in 1949, so just kind of post-war era. And uh, at that time, you know, we had basically three broadcast networks plus, plus public TV, educational TV, I think it was called in Iowa. Um, at any rate, so this policy called for those networks to cover important controversies 
and they were required to cover them in the language of the, the rules in a way that was honest, equitable, and balanced. Fair and balanced. Um, that legislation, that, those rules, they were rules in the FCC, not, not legislation. Um, those rules persisted for uh, quite a long time. Um, in the late 60s, the courts um, upheld the Fairness Doctrine. It was challenged as unconstitutional um, in that time period. And, um, but the courts reasoned that the scarcity of broadcast spectrum, the scarcity of news outlets, required that we continue to have this kind of limitation on, on networks. So scarcity was a critical factor that the courts saw as justifying why we wanted those three networks to all cover things in a fair way. By um, 1985, however, I would say sometime in there in my reading, um, the question of whether the doctrine had um, a chilling effect on freedom of speech uh, kind of took, took hold, gained traction. And people, um, and, and at that time, we were just beginning to see the cable news and satellite news uh, kind of start to emerge. So that was in like around 85. And then in 87, during Reagan's presidency, um, the uh, FCC eliminated the policy. And when you think about it, um, you think about trying to impose that on the myriad of channels that were coming, becoming available then, the practicality of it is an interesting thing to try to think about and whether you could even have such a doctrine today. Um, but bottom line is that rule went away in 87. And then in 1988, the Rush Limbaugh radio station, a radio program was syndicated one year later. And that was really the beginning of opening the door for you know, news channels, that, uh, w whether it was radio or whether it was television, uh, cable television, um, emerging as uh, sort of mono, <laughs> monolithic sorts of deliveries of news. So it's really interesting, you know, the, the, con the, the coming together of, you know, the political atmosphere at that time and the technology that was developing all caused this to, to fall away. There have been attempts in more recent times to bring back some kind of fairness doctrine um, periodically in Congress, not in the FCC even, but in Congress itself, and none of those have really taken hold. They just, you know, I think part of it is the practicality of, you know, how you rein in something that's, you know, as big as it is now, and, um, and there's not the political will. And there is a, you know, I think there is a strong argument that, that gets put forth about free speech. So, so there we were, that went away. In its place then came this profit-driven news media. In, before we had news networks, and we had those three networks, their revenue came primarily from their other programming. Their advertising revenue came from soap operas, it came from sitcoms, it came from all the other entertainment programming that they offered throughout the day. When you, when you put forth a channel that is nothing but news, your advertising revenue has to come through that, through that news programming. And I think that's an important thing to keep in mind in terms of the influence that advertising revenue has when you're offering a news channel compared to advertising re revenue when you're offering a, um, an entertainment program. You know, the, the old networks back in the day did, you know, 30 minutes of news in the evening, 6 to 6.30, and that was kind of the news. They could practically give that time away. That could practically be a public service because they were getting their revenue everywhere else. But that's not true when you talk about a station like a channel like like CNN. So, um, so that whole notion of the twenty four seven news channels, and you know, being profit driven and need, needing to have revenue. Um, the other thing that happened as this whole notion of profit driven channels, of only news came about, is that commentary was much less expensive than investigative journalism. So it costs a lot less. To have, to have Julian come and you know, give his opinion about things than it would cost for Deb to go out and do an investigative story on a topic and you know, do, you know, do traveling to sites and so on and so forth. 
So we, we, and if you think about what you see in the evening when you watch any of the news channels, it's a lot of commentary. It's a lot of four heads on the screen, sometimes talking all at once. <laughs> um, and we see more, you know, what I would describe as non-news, more things that are bordering on entertainment or um, news that's not really news. You know, I, I really don't care too much about what Taylor Swift is up to these days. But you know, the, if if some people do, and that draws them part of audience, then we'll call that news. So. Um, so those factors have all influenced the environment again and made it more, uh, you know, more, uh, I guess, easier, I'll just say, for, um, you know, for disinformation, misinformation, and information all to travel on the same channels. Um, and then, of course, there's the talk radio situation as well, which I've alluded to already. And then uh, social media, of course, you know, and, and there's a lot of discussion these days, and we'll talk about this more uh, later on this morning, but there's a lot of discussion these days about whether or not the, 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 the companies like Google and Facebook and Reddit, whether they have a responsibility for the content that goes through their platform. And, and that's an interesting discussion about, about their editorial responsibility. And, and I think that's, that's a, but right now, generally they take, most of them take pretty much a hands-off approach, save a few limitations here or there, or a few um, decisions that they will make here or there. But generally, uh, they pretty much keep their hands off content um, for the most part, um, you know, and, and, and maybe manage a small percentage of what travels over their systems. So, um, uh, you know, and you know, they have, and then another way in which uh, the social media contributes to this fake news situation is that, you know, their filters and their algorithms deliver to you more of the same. So if you like something, you're gonna get more of it. And that helps to intensify that notion of a filter bubble that keeps you getting the information that you click on, the information that you like. Uh, and why do they do that? Because they want to keep you there. It's attractive to stay in a place where the things you get keep reinforcing you. We talked about that earlier. And then that gives you, um, that gives their advertisers access to you. And, you know, and indeed, they tailor your, their advertising to you. So they'll look at what you're interested in and then lo and behold, there's the advertising for it. So their systems are designed to try to hold on to you in order to serve their advertisers, largely. And then I think there is the, the whole matter of the power of, of technology and tech companies. And um, I'm gonna show a video. Um, uh, this is uh, 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 recorded in uh, Norway. Uh, but I think it does a very nice job of giving you an example of the power that an institution like Google has over what you see or what you don't see. In other words, what they can do if they choose to. So let's take a look at that and listen to Anders Ekström. So whenever I visit a school and talk to students, I always ask them the same thing. Why do you Google? Why is Google the search engine of choice for you? Strangely enough, I always get the same three answers. One, because it works, which is a great answer. That's why I Google too. Uh, two, somebody will say, I really don't know of any alternatives. It's not an equally great answer. And my reply to that is usually try to Google the word search engine. You may find a couple of interesting alternatives. Um, and last but not least, thirdly, inevitably, one student will raise her his hand and say, with Google, I'm certain to always get the best unbiased search result. Certain to always get the best unbiased search result. Now, as a man of the humanities, albeit a digital humanities man, that just makes my skin curl. Even if I too realize that that trust, that idea of the unbiased search result is a cornerstone in, in our collective love for and appreciation of Google. I will show you why that philosophically is almost an impossibility. Uh, but let me first elaborate just a little bit on a basic principle 
behind each search query that we sometimes seem to forget. So whenever you set out to Google something, start by asking yourself this, am I looking for an isolated fact? What is the capital of France? What are the building blocks of a water molecule? Great, Google away. You know, there's not a group of scientists who are this close to proving that it's actually London and H3O. You don't see a big conspiracy among those things. We, we agree on a global scale what the answers are to these isolated facts. But if you complicate your question just a little bit and ask something like, um, why is there an Israeli-Palestine conflict? You're not exactly looking for a singular fact anymore. You're looking for knowledge, which is something way more complicated and delicate. And to get to knowledge, you have to bring 10 or 20 or 100 facts to the table and acknowledge them and say, yes, these are all true, but because of who I am, young or old or black or white or gay or straight, I will value them differently. And I will say, yes, this is true, but this is more important to me than that. And this is where it becomes interesting because this is where we become human. This is where we start to argue, to form society and to really get somewhere. We need to filter all our facts here through friends and neighbors and parents and children and coworkers and newspapers and magazines to finally be grounded in real knowledge, which is something that a search engine is a poor help to achieve. So uh, I promised you an example just to show you why it's so hard to get to the point of true, clean, objective knowledge as, as food for thought. I will conduct a couple of simple queries, search queries. We'll start by Michelle Obama, First Lady of the United States, and we'll click for pictures. It works really well, as you can see. It's a uh, perfect search result, more or less. It's just her in the picture, not even a president. Um, how does this work? Quite simple. I mean, Google uses a lot of smartness to achieve this, but quite simply, they look at two things more than anything. First, what does it say in the caption? What does it say under the picture on each website? Does it say Michelle Obama under the picture? Pretty good indication it's actually her on there. Second, Google looks at the picture file, the name of the file as such uploaded to the website. Again, is it called michelleobama.jpg? Pretty good indication it's not Clint Eastwood in the picture. So you got those two and you get a search result like this, almost. Now, in 2009, Michelle Obama was the victim of a racist campaign where people set out to insult her through her search results. There was a picture distributed widely over the internet where her face was distorted to look like a monkey. And that picture was published all over. And people published it very, very purposefully to get it up here in the search result. They made sure to write Michelle Obama in the caption and they made sure to upload the picture as michelleobama.jpg or the like. So you get why, to manipulate the search result. And it worked too. So when you picture Google for Michelle Obama in 2009, that distorted monkey picture showed up among the first results. Now, the, the results are self-cleansing, and that's sort of the beauty of it, because Google measures relevance every, every hour, every day. Uh, however, Google didn't settle for that this time. They just thought, that's racist, and it's a bad search result, and we're going to go back and clean that up manually. We are going to write some code and fix it, which they did. And I don't think that anyone in this room thinks that that was a bad idea. Me neither. But then a couple of years go by, and the world's most Googled Anders, Anders Bering Breivik, uh, did what he did. This is July 22nd in 2011, and a terrible day in Norwegian history. This man, a terrorist, um, blew up couple of government buildings, walking distance from where we are right now in Oslo, Norway, and then he traveled out to the island of Utøya and shot and killed uh, a group of kids. Almost 80 people died that day. Um, and a lot of people would describe this act of terror as two steps, that he did two things. He blew up the buildings and he shot those kids. It's not true. It was three steps. He blew up those buildings, he shot those kids, and he sat down and waited for the world to Google him. And he prepared all three steps equally well. And if there was somebody who immediately understood this, it was a Swedish web developer, a search engine optimization expert in Stockholm named Nicky Lindqvist. He's also a very political guy, and he was right out there in social media, on his blog, on Facebook, and he told everybody, if there's something that this guy wants right now, it's to control the image of himself. 
Let's see if we can distort that. Let's see if we in the civilized world can protest against what he did through insulting him in his search results. And how? He told all of his readers the following. Go out there on the internet. Find pictures of dog poop on sidewalks. Find pictures of dog poops on sidewalks. Publish them in your feeds, on your websites, on your blogs. Make sure to write the terrorist's name in the caption. Make sure to name the picture file, breivik.jpg. Let's teach Google that that's the face of the terrorist. And it worked. Two years after that campaign against Michelle Obama, this manipulation campaign against Anders Piring Breivik worked. If you picture Google for him the weeks after the July 22nd events from Sweden, you'd see <laughs> that picture of dog poop high up in the search result as a little protest. Strangely enough, Google didn't intervene this time. They did not step in and manually clean those search results up. So the million dollar question, is there anything different between these two happenings here? Is there, is there anything different between what happened to Michelle Obama and what happened to Anders Bering Breivik? Mm, of course not. It's the exact same thing, yet Google intervened in one case and not in the other. Why? Well, because Michelle Obama is an honorable person, that's why, and Anders Bering Breivik is a despicable person. See what happens there? An evaluation of a person takes place and there's only one power in the world, one power player in the world with the authority to say who's who. We like you, we dislike you, we believe in you, we don't believe in you. You're right, you're wrong, you're true, you're false, you're Obama and you're Breivik. That's power if I ever saw it. That's power if I ever saw it. So, it's a bit of insight into, into what technology companies and the technologies can do. And the question is, will they, should they? Those are the difficult questions, I think. So, the information systems have, have created a, an information universe very different from the universe that Jonathan Swift was talking about. And it's a universe that is, uh, is, is uh, influenced by a profit motive, it's interest in, in, uh, by, by public policy and, uh, and by you know, the design of the, of the whole information universe in which we currently live. The third trend that the, uh, that the um, Rand Report uh, pointed to that is, uh, is creating, an, uh, creating and driving um, fake news through our information universe further are trends in education. And so they talk about, first of all, the crowding out of social studies to privilege reading and math. And this really started under the No Child Left Behind legislation of the Bush administration. And, um, and, and the, the emphasis in education shifted toward test preparation and, uh, and being able to, um, to respond to questions at a, at a factual knowledge level at, rather than an inferential level or, or hi higher level of thinking. Um, it's interesting to look at this um, Annenberg um, Constitution Day uh, survey from 2019. Um, they asked people if they could name the three branches of the government. 39% of those people could name all three branches of the government. That is frightening to me. And again, this is a, a, a well-designed de well statistically sig uh, uh, statistical sampling of the population. Um, 22% couldn't name any branch of the government. I find those horrifying numbers. And when we live in an environment where we're seeing the balance of power among the three branches of government struggling in the way they are today, the fact that we have so many people who don't even know there are three branches is pretty frightening, I think, um, in this, um, in this uh, environment. Um, other things about social studies that are interesting. Um, the NAEP exam, the National Assessment of Educational Progress, is the, is the nation's report card on education. And you know, so you know, we are still living in, an test, in a testing environment in our schools, unfortunately. Um, and and um, the scores of those tests oftentimes drive policy and influence decisions that are made about how students will be taught. Um, 
the na so so people to pay attention to them, and it, we are still in an environment where what gets tested gets taught. So the NAEP uh, board, the board that governs the NAEP, had decided that it would add testing that they were already testing in reading and math. They would add some testing in um, in social in the social studies. Um, and so they started developing a test on civics and a test on U.S. history. Um, and uh, just within the last few months, they have made a decision to put off development of those tests until at least 2029. They have also decided that they wouldn't, uh, they wouldn't pursue development of testing at all in economics or geography. Because who needs to know about anything in geography these days, right? No. <laughs> So I find those, again, I find those frightening decisions because they will influence what happens in schools. They will influence how much of social studies really gets taught. Another, another distressing signal about knowledge about social studies is the recent discussion in the Board of Educational Examiners in Iowa and discussion with the Education Committee in the legislature to reduce the um, certification or licensure requirements for teaching social studies. So the suggestion is to dramatically cut back how many courses people need to take in order to be a social studies teacher. In other words, you don't really need to know that much to teach social studies, or we're not going to teach that much social studies, one or the other. At any rate, I find that also a distressing signal about what's happening in education that will affect um, this whole business of fake news. Um, so those are, those are disheartening directions in education. Um, furthermore, um, it, there's also a, we have also seen a decline in emphasis on critical thinking in schools. So the um, Stanford History Education Group last year um, did, a, did an interesting investigation of high school students in that, in the, I think that was in that region in Southern California. Um, and they gave them very real world questions about fake news. So they would show them a Twitter feed and ask them questions about that Twitter feed. Or they would show them a website and ask them questions about those websites. Let me give you a couple of examples of what was on that test and how students did on those examples. So the, they, I mean, this, this is an, it's an interesting test to look at. So they contextualize a question around the Fukushima nuclear disaster. They show students a photo of dead flowers. And then they ask students to, they, they don't, it's not a multiple guess test. They write their observations about this information that they have. So the information they're given is, you know, some, some text about the disaster, and then a photo of some dead flowers. So. Less than 20% of students constructed responses that questioned the source of the post or the source of the photo. There's no photographic evidence in the photo that it was taken anywhere near the plant. It's just fo dead flowers somewhere. Nearly 40% of students who took this test argued that the post provided strong evidence about conditions near the plant. So they didn't ask themselves any questions about the context of the photo. They assumed, made assumptions about the context. Um, they were presented with a tweet that indicated that a high percentage of people think that the NRA is out of touch with gun owners. The statement was based on polling that was supported by moveon.org. They were told that. Less than one third of students questioned any political motives of moveon.org, just took them at face value. That's the kind of critical thinking that we need to be having taught in schools. And clearly, at least this study would suggest that it is perhaps not happening or not happening to the extent that it should. So those are interesting trends in education. And the last one is the one near and dear to my heart. And that's the decline in support for school libraries. Because at the beginning of this um, uh, talk, I, I talked about why librarians are, the, are people to be talking about this issue. So what we have happening in schools all across the country is that we're taking librarians out of schools. Between 2000 and 2015, more than 9,000 
full-time equivalent school library positions were eliminated in this country, according to the National Center for Education Statistics. That's about a 19% reduction in school librarians at a time when we need them more than ever. The number of Iowa school libraries dropped 40% um, in about that same time frame, according to the Iowa Department of Education. So we're not any better, better, probably worse, than a lot of states in the nation. Those, all of those indicators about education don't, don't predict, in my view, a very promising future for a population that is well-informed in the sense that Thomas Jefferson wanted us to be well-informed. So those are those three trends, or things that drive fake news through our society. Um, the, that kind of human cognitive processes or the biases that we just lean toward. Um, the changes in our information systems and those trends in education. And all of them are things we need to be aware of and we need to be thinking about what we're going to do in order to rein any of them in, in order to, um, in order to alleviate this problem. So I'm gonna start, uh, talk a little bit about what we do. We're gonna, I'm gonna say a couple of things about what we can do on a personal level, and I'm gonna, and, and I'm gonna have you do some thinking with me. I'm, I'm getting tired, I've been working hard here, so we'll put you to work. <laughs> Uh, but I first want to talk about a concept called lateral reading. And I don't know if that's a concept that all of you are familiar with, but it's, it's, it's an interesting thing, again, to be cognizant of as a consumer of information. Because um, we are used to reading vertically. But when we read on the internet, we need to think about reading laterally. Let me give you an example to show you what I mean. So let's say that I was interested in this organization called ALEC. And what do I do if I'm interested in an organization? I go to their website, and I go to the About, and I read about them. So here I am at the ALEC website, and I'll read what, a little bit of what it has to say about them. So the American Legislative Exchange Council is America's largest nonpartisan voluntary membership organization of state legislators dedicated to the principles of limited government, free markets, and federalism. Um, and then it goes on to say who all it, it involves. All Americans deserve an efficient, effective, and accountable government that puts the people in control. Boy, that is all sounding pretty noble. Um, so if I'm going to lead, read laterally, what I will do is open another tab and just see if there's any other perspective on ALEC out there. So I click on a tab, and I'll just do a Google search on ALEC. And let's see what I get. So if I look down these um, hits, first at the top, of course, I have their website where I've just been that tells me about them from their perspective. If I read down, um, I, have, I could go to a Wikipedia article, and this is a place where I recommend Wikipedia because um, it's a quick place to go and get information and oftentimes quite good information. So this is a great use for Wikipedia. So I could go there and I could get information there. I could go down to, hmm, exposing Alec. Where is that from? Well, if I read the fine print, it's from the Atlantic. Well, now there's, an, there's, an, there's a periodical that I kind of trust. I know it's left-leaning, but I, um, it's one that I, that I trust. So I might open it up and read that. I can proceed down and um, see what else is here. Here's a USA Today article about what is ALEC. Um, Brookings uh, Institute has a, uh, something about them. NPR has something about them. I could choose any one of those and open that up in a new tab and start to read that and start to see how that compares with what I just read on the About Alec page. That's lateral reading. So reading across the tabs, basically, in order, to, uh, in order to open my mind, so to speak, to other um, information from other sources to verify or refute what I've just read in one place. And that's the kind of reading that is effective when we're, doing, when we're using the internet to get our information because it gives us the opportunity to round out that information from other sources. It kind of takes us out of our bubble. So lateral reading is certainly one, um, one thing we can train ourselves to do on a personal level. I think a, another thing we can do on a personal level is think about what scripts or questions do we want to have running in the back of our minds all the time. 
because we have to defend ourselves all the time in this information universe. So we need to train ourselves to have that little voice in our, in our brain that says, yes, but whenever we see something, whenever we read something that is at all tends to be an opinion, the yes, but voice needs to ring back there and say, yes, but. We need to be curious. When we read something, we need to have that little voice say, I wonder. We need to be strategic. We need to keep asking ourselves that question when we watch the news. Am I getting news here or am I getting comment on the news? What am I really taking in here? And have that awareness of reminding ourselves to be strategic about looking at fact and looking at commentary. Uh, we need to be investigative. There's always the question of what more do I need to know? Because there's probably always something more I need to know. What's the next question? Clearly, in this environment, we need to be skeptical. We need to do that says who kind of thing that is not really socially acceptable, but is probably something we should do. And we need to be metacognitive. We need to be self-aware, asking ourselves that question of did I remember to whatever, did I remember to um, think about the other side, and so on. So those are some things that I think we can start to do um, on a personal basis. We can try to remember that notion of lateral reading. We can try to keep these uh, habits of mind uh, uh, forward as we're, as we're taking in information. Um, so that brings us then to, you know, to getting our information in the first place. And that's where you come into play. So I'm going to ask you to hand out um, those um, pages. Um, Vanessa Otero, a few years ago, started developing what she called the media bias chart because she was concerned about people getting all their information from one side or the other side of the political spectrum. And so uh, in pursuit of that, she started to map where various news outlets fall across a spectrum. And um, I'm going to ask you to notice uh, something that's different on my screen from your charts. I have some numbers. So I have a, uh, a minus, I, well, first let's do the vertical axis. I have a 0 to 64. And you may want to jot that down on your chart. So 0 here up to 64. Then across the, uh, across the horizontal axis, I have a minus 42 over here and a plus 42 over there. That's the scale that Otero used to try to place news outlets on a grid in order for us to get a sense of what's good and what's not so good. And you'll notice that she labels each of those areas with kind of a generalization about those area, areas. So down here at the bottom, where it's way liberal and sensational or clickbait, she says, just don't read this. <laughs> so if you have a news outlet that falls in that region, it's not worth your time, is basically what she's saying. And the same on the other side, um, on the conservative side. So these are minus 42 in score, very, very liberal, and zero on the vertical axis really uh, not, worth, not worth your time. So um, and then there's a category that confirms your existing biases and kind of in this region. And those regions are just general. general. They're not, you know, they're not um, uh, so, so, art, uh, so articulated here. And then uh, this circle up here, is a, this is a great source of news. And the top oval up there is great in-depth sources of news. So you can see how she's sort of giving you a generalized view of what each of those um, of what each of those areas on the grid represents but she she actually what what she does then is collects articles from that source and analyzes them through a rubric and gives them a score so you'll see the wall street journal up there i rounded the numbers but the wall street journal is sitting up there in that top circle great in-depth source of news it's sitting at two left, right, just slightly right. A 48 for its reliability, 
for the complexity of its, uh, of its work and so on. So that's pretty high. Now remember that the scores are averages of many articles. So to get to a 64 is just probably not going to happen. You're probably not going to have a, any publication that's going to be perfect every time in order to get a 64. 48 is a, is a very good um, reliability score. And two is a very good score in terms of left-right. It's nearly in the middle. So that publication rates very well. I'm going to give you a list of publications. And you can work with each other, or you can work alone, however, whatever is your style. But what I'd like you to do is I'd like you to place them on this grid. So kind of, you don't have to give them numbers. You can if you want. Ian will give them numbers. <laughs> um, but, uh, but if you don't, uh, if you don't want to, if you just want to put them about where you think they would be, that would be fine. So here's a list. I thought we'd just do 10. But she has many more than that. But it gets crowded. So take that list of 10 and see where you would put them on this grid. And then we'll talk about them. So I'll give you a little time to play with that. English, because that's what we access the most. Good question. You can skip them if you're not familiar with them. Don't worry. No worries. Just do the ones you know. Hardly anybody ever knows News Punch. It's kind of fun to see where it is, though. <laughs> Hmm? News punch? We'll we'll look at it. I mean, we'll look at her scoring of it. It's a good sign if you don't know what it is. <laughs> it's it's kind of in the same place as Infowars, if you know that. Yeah. <laughs> right. We're going to look at it. <laughs> you bet. Well, should we take a look at what Otero has to say about them? You ready? OK. So um, she calls her, she, her the title of her, um, her uh, website is Adfontes Media. And um, I was a Latin teacher. Um, this is really to the media fountain. So the fountain, this is about the uh, fountain, the media fountain um, is, is kind of where, where she's at with that. So let's take a look. Now, um, she has, it, so if you just Google Ad Fontes Media, you'll find her if you're curious later on. 
So th this is a place on her website where she ranks individual news sources. So which ones do you want to look at? We won't need to look at all of them, but which ones are you curious about? And just shout out if there's one you'd be curious to see. Al Jazeera. Al Jazeera? Sure. <clears throat> so she gives you the individual article scores, by the way, down here. This is a long list. It goes on and on. So you can see what she was looking at when she, when she or her team analyzed this. The reliability score is 49.47, and the bias is minus 3.71. So, so it's a little bit left, mm -hmm. and 49.47 is right up there in the vicinity of the Wall Street Journal. So it's, uh, it's a little far, slightly farther left than the Wall Street is right, um, but right up in that vicinity. Another one you're curious about? Oh, and then I'll just show you that this list of articles goes on and on. Um, and, and, and I will also tell you that these scores change because they're constantly looking at things. So they, the, the score, I, honestly, I, I looked at these, I guess it was probably Wednesday, and uh, I had to change the Wall Street Journal score today when I went in to check it because it had shifted very slightly, but it had shifted. So that's, it's a dynamic process. It's not, a, it's not like they did it one time and now they're done. They keep adding articles and, keep, and that scores keep shifting um, as they go along. So um, at any rate, is there another one that you're curious about? Huffington Post. Huffington Post, good, good pick. Let's go look at that. Okay, here we go. Their overall score um, is just about 40 in reliability, but the bias is almost minus 12. So left leaning. Good, you know. Good content, but left-leaning is, is, is kind of the, the summation of it. Um, yeah, you want to see The Economist? Yeah. Sure, or if there's something else that you want to see, we can take a quick look also. <laughs> oh, I thought it was. It's on the, it's on the map, but I, it's not on this short, this abbreviated list. Um, it is on her chart, though, and we'll look at the chart in just a minute. Is there another one from the list that anybody, we can do one more? <laughs> Here, here's the thing that she, she has acknowledged about Fox News, she has two scores for them, uh -huh. is that the editorial side of Fox News is one thing and the news is another. Um, and she's, she's written about that, she has a blog, and she's written about that, that it's difficult to generalize about Fox News because they're reporting is, yeah. Easy to generalize. Oh, it is easy. <laughs> well, let's see. Let's see what she says. Okay, the reliability, 23. So that's below the, the midpoint. And bias is almost 25. Is that what you would have predicted? Oh, you would have it lower. Yeah. <laughs> you had it really low. Okay, so you get the idea of uh, of what's going on there. And as I say, they change um, regularly. The chart, when she fills it in, looks like this, and it's a little crowded. But you can see the Economist up there, John, right below Time. So it's a little. Um, I can point to it on here. Right here in the red? Yeah. Got it? Yeah, Is that where you would have thought? It's just below the yeah, Wall Street Journal. Uh, it's conservative, but very reliable. Very reliable. Uh -huh. Very neutral in the middle. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, yeah, but it's down there in the crap level. Below the red line. So, so, you know, so if you read across on her chart, contains inaccurate fabricated information, <laughs> and that's all of these across here. Yeah, it is impartial. It'll take on, on anybody, but it's, yeah, right, <laughs> exactly. 
InfoWars is down here. News Punch is right down here with InfoWars. So it's a similar publication, very right and, and very much crap. Well, you know, start looking over here. This is the problem with the chart, and it's why I, um, I like to look at the list. You got it? Where you thought it would be? Yeah. Okay, I'll give you a minute to take a look. And, um, the Times is up there right below BBC and NPR. Just a little bit to the left, not too far. Kind of about as far left as the journal is to the right. They're really comparable. One slightly right, one slightly left. Mm -hmm. What's the blue dot at the right? That's BBC and NPR. Um, I think it's USA Today. Oh, okay. Really? I have a hard time believing that. <laughs> That's what she found. It's, it's owned by the same, you know, like kind of corporation. Get it. Everything, right? Get it. Right. And yeah. Say, like, it like comes free with everything. <laughs> kind of well, it's Barry Joe's favorite source. USA Today. <laughs> I'm teasing. That's right. <laughs> that are reading level. Um, so you know, so that's so that's the thing. It's kind of fun to go back, and you can look, you know, you can look at her uh, at her website, and I think you'll find it interesting, entertaining, and maybe helpful. Um, we have to think about other personal sources and or other personal solutions to this problem as well, though. And so one of them is. Um, getting our news from multiple viewpoints. And I like to share a, a news outlet that's an aggregator of news called All Sides. Because what they do is take a story and they give you, the, they, get, they, they lead you to the reportage on that story from usually pretty good sources, but they're from the left, the center, and the right. So if you think about Otero's chart and you want to read across, on a story, you can get the LA Times story is the left one that they use for coronavirus here. Uh, the center is Reuters, and the right is the, New York, right is the New York Post in this case. And they're different ones each time, but they classify them by their political leaning. And it's, so it's an interesting way to do a one-stop look. It's kind of lateral reading <laughs> built in for you. You don't even need extra tabs. But I, I would I encourage you to take a look at that and just see what you think and whether it's something that you like. It's a way to get us, again, out of our filter bubbles. It's a way to see how different organizations are interpreting the news. Um, so all sides. It's just allsides.com. Um, then another, uh, another aggregator. I, I move from aggregator to aggregator um, by, by the month, I think. But my current favorite is Axios, which, if you noticed on the chart, was right up at the top center. And Axios uh, basically gives you the news of the day. I think it's always 10 stories if you get their feed. And um, what they'll do is give you kind of the headline the receding American dream happens to be the thing that came up at the top. And you can get a little brief idea of what the story is about. And then if you're interested, you can go deeper. So in a matter of a minute or two, you can go down the 10 big stories of the day, many of them today about the coronavirus, and you can um, decide which of those you um, are interested in. And then whichever one it is, you can go deeper. And then it will take you to a story um, on that um, on that topic, and it's pretty extensive then. So if you um, you know if if you're a person who doesn't want to spend your entire day looking around for news, it's a it's an efficient way to get the lead the, the lead in and then to decide if the story is of interest to you or not. And then of course another personal solution is to use a fact checker. And this is, again, another lateral reading strategy. So when you're reading something, you can open a tab to like factcheck.org. And as you're reading something, then you can you know, tab over to the fact checker and check. And then you can come back and continue your reading. So again, that notion of lateral reading gives you a way to go over, look at the fact checker, see what it has to say, and then come back. So every time there's a major speech, the fact checkers all you know, uh, uh, 
uh, uh, use all of their resources to fact check anything that's there. So especially big speeches. But any news story, you're likely to be able to find information probably on one of these three leading fact checkers. Factcheck.org is my favorite. Um, Snopes um, and the Washington Post fact checker. And if you're wondering if the Washington Post fact checker leans left, because the Washington Post leans left, their fact checker it has been described in critiques as being fair and balanced in the fact checking, but liberal in the things it chooses to fact check. <laughs> <laughs> Factcheck.org. Or a Washington Post that fact checker will, is more likely to fact check. Yeah, sure. Conservative yeah, conservative leaning stories. Yeah, that was my point. Yep, exactly. Yes. Factcheck.org is, um, I think, is probably the, it seems to me to be the most middle of the road in terms of what it fact checks and, and the, the resources that it uses. So, and, it, and, it, and they give you the sources for their information. So I, I, I trust it perhaps a little bit more than any others, but they're, they're all useful. So that brings us to, then to the problem, those are all things we can do personally, ways we can improve our own behavior, but then there's the question of what should be happening? What should, what should be happening across society to address this problem? And I'm gonna ask you to just take a few minutes to converse a little bit about this, because I think in this, in this period where we're leading up to a campaign for um, you know, for the election of a new president and thinking about what we want to ask of our leadership, it's a good time to be reflecting on what would we support or what would we not support. So I'm going to ask you to just organize yourselves into two or three groups. You can suit yourselves for how big a group you want to join in on. But I'd like your group to choose one of these questions. I don't care. You decide what you're interested in. I'm not going to assign you. But you can talk about what legal or policy solutions could reduce the proliferation of misinformation and disinformation. And that policy could be FCC regulations. It could be policies that tech companies uh, adopt. It could be policies uh, of, you know, of that sort um, that, that, you know, that, 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 are, that are set by le leadership. Um, or it could be. Um, legal solutions, what, the, what Congress could or should do, what should we be looking for out of our government in this, or nothing uh, from our government. Um, or you could talk about technical solutions. So this is, you know, we saw in the video what they can do. What should they be doing in order to, um, in order to rein in disinformation, or should they totally be hands off? What do you think should be happening um, in that situation? Should they be using the technical solutions they have? And if so, what technical solutions are you aware of that they could use? Um, the third one is what educational solutions for people of all ages. Um, this is a problem that has arisen in recent times to become the big problem that it is today. So we have to think, what can we do for you know, adults of all ages? And what can we do in schools? So it's not just a school problem. It's a bigger problem than that in terms of education. Um, and libraries might have a role in that. Could be. Or you could talk about how do we balance free speech and any kind of limitations or, or, or manipulation of information. And, and you know, to what extent do we, do we wave the flag of free speech and say, we can't, we can't, we can't, because we need to protect free speech. And, and if we don't take that position, then how do we protect free speech in some way? So there, none of them is, uh, you know, is an easy solution. There's no one right answer for any questions. But I'd like you to just take a few minutes and talk about that a little bit. And then I'd like you to have somebody from your group ready to kind of share what your conversation sounded like. So I think we can kind of make groups of you know, three or four and just move yourself into, into a spot. So if you, if you want to join, yeah, okay, they're good. Two is fine. If we can do a group of three or a group of four or something like that, group of four, five.
Oh, that would be fun. That would be fun to do if you think it would be useful.
but that has to be recorded. So I'll start again. We'll ask each group to share with the other. And uh, the, this group over here was wrestling with the question of balancing free speech with the notion of any kind of limitations on free speech. So they were brave to take that on. And we just like a little idea of some of the issues that came up in your conversation. So if someone there or a couple of you would share briefly a couple of thoughts. Uh, one is to the extent the limitations, so would we look to government? Because uh, we're very skeptical of that approach. Yeah, interesting. So one of the issues that came up then was, you know, if there were limitations to be set, who would set them? And if you look to government, there's a certain amount of skepticism because remember that chart about trust? <laughs> government was pretty low. All right, what else? All right, so another possibility is kind of putting it back on the individual ultimately, but using our education system to help people develop the understanding early on that with freedoms come responsibilities and what those responsibilities look like as a consumer of information, so to speak. Yeah, all right, excellent, thank you very much. Over here, you were talking about, they were talking about the question related to educational solutions, and where did you go with that conversation briefly? actually. Uh, I would say that we were looking at obviously schools and the importance of particularly a teacher librarian because as someone who's come out of school for no fault of their own classroom teachers don't have the same kind of background and understanding that teacher librarians acquire through their educational experiences. So somehow we need to continue to focus on helping and I've started to use the word educate whether it's our building administrators um, our school communities about the importance of teacher librarians and what they bring to the setting. Um, okay, so let me just reiterate that for our viewing audience. So in thinking about this, one of the topics that, they, that, they, that your group discussed, if I'm getting this correctly, is the importance and the role that a teacher librarian plays in the school in addressing the problems of misinformation and disinformation. And if you don't have someone with that kind of training background that is special to a librarian and different from the training that a classroom teacher get, has, then you don't have someone there who can look at the nuances of the issues around um, misinformation and disinformation. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. Another? Is that your central one? You have we another just, thought? We just discussed the issue that you alluded to earlier. Uh, we can all remember being taught to the difference between fact and opinion and given what wondering if that still happens because it's more important. Yeah. So, Never, so that's something a regular classroom teacher yeah. would probably be, be responsible for. So in the classroom then, we would hope to see an emphasis on understanding the difference between fact and opinion and being able to differentiate those. And maybe if I may add, being able to look at an assertion and determine whether there is evidence to support that assertion. Those are kinds of things that classroom teachers um, may need to pay more attention to in this um, fake news environment. Anything else for the good of the cause? All right, thank you very much. I think these are important questions for us to have conversation with more broadly um, uh, than, than this group that's here today. So I'm gonna close just with a, a little admonishment. So let us not surrender to the idea of a post-truth world. Let us rather be conscientious, evidence-seeking information consumers. And with that, I will close for today. College, um, uh, ICPL, and Kara for her generous support and the Newsom Fund um, for making this possible. Uh, that's a fund uh, at the School of Library and Information Science. Thank you.